I got it. Green light. Psalm 29, uh, read the entire psalm. Okay, when you get down to verse 3 to 9, you'll see a phrase, the voice of the Lord, uh, seven times. So that's obviously a ref- reference to the scriptures, Bible, God's word. 29.1, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Okay, that's acceptable worship. In the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divided the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth everyone speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Okay, so 7 through 9 you'll see that God's word is what is sustaining the world, according to Hebrews 1, 8, or 1, 3. Okay, but in verse uh, 2, I want to look at the last half. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now, if you would, in John 4. Uh, John 3, John 4, two conversations, personal conversations uh, the Lord Jesus had with individuals. And then Acts 8 is another one. Those are places in the Bible that records the techniques of witnessing. Okay, so and you can see how the Lord does it. John 4, verse 7, he's talking to a woman of Samaria. John 4, 7. Let's go ahead and pray before we go any further. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand uh, this idea. Help us to have worship that is worthy of thee. Help us to love you more in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, seven. Uh, then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. And his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Okay, so uh, you can see the technique going on here. He's going to ignore that idea. Okay, racism. He's going to ignore that idea, move forward. And he's going to try to get her to think, to think and consider. Okay, he's not following a, a little detailed plan, which is not bad to do, but still the idea is to get her to think and consider uh, the truth here. Jesus answered said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God... And who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Oh, never heard of that before. Living water, what's that? The woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, and from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So she's thinking physical, he's thinking spiritual. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Okay, she's still thinking physical. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Change the topic. Get her to think. Now get her to think about herself. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. He said, "You're, you're You're not as, you know, you know, go to the marriage altar as much as Liz Taylor did, but uh, you got five. And the one you got is legally not yours, but okay, still, that's a whole different issue. So the woman said unto him, uh, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Yeah, you perceived right. 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Okay? <clears throat> That's the general consensus of the Jews, biblically. And then Jesus saith unto her, Woman, uh, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. Lady, you don't know what you worship. And that's the truth for most people. Okay? You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. For the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers. So there's fake worshipers. Where the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. That's what pleases him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith, saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, if you would, drop down to 39. Okay, verse 27 and 38, the disciples show up. Jesus tells them some things. 39. Okay, this woman took off, went back into town. 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Well, no, he didn't, but that's what you're thinking. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and abode there two days. Now, that might be a prophetic statement if you look at the Bible prophetically or doctrinally. It might be, I'm not sure. Samaritans are uh, Gentiles. And so is that a, pro a prophecy because two days are as a thousand years with the Lord? So is that 2,000 years church time period? I wouldn't have a problem with that if a person wants to go that way. I don't think it could be definitive, but that sure is hopeful to think about if we run the calendar. Okay, but even at that, 41, And many more believed because of his own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Mm, boy, that's a good result, isn't it? Okay, but the idea I want to look at is at the end of verse 23, it says, For the Father seeketh such to worship him, and God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Okay, now the idea of worship, okay, uh, some churches will put under marquee morning worship service. Okay, and, and in a way that's true, uh, but a lot of times it's not done properly, but still in a way that's true. And the contemporary churches, they have a worship team. And now how they do that is they usually stand outside of a beauty parlor and wait for some guy to walk out and got a perm. And then if he's got a guitar, then they put him in the worship team. Who cares about salvation experience? Just a guy that can jam a little bit. And that's what's going on in the contemporary churches. If you doubt it, uh, on a vacation, try one out. Okay? And if they got the lights down low in the morning, you know, like we did in Australia, we walked out. Okay, we see what's going on here. And went to a Wesleyan church. And uh, so that's how it goes. Okay, the dictionary, the di dictionary definition of worship is an expression of reverence or adoration or great admiration or devotion. Now, a lot of people have that towards celebrities. Okay, um, the capo of the religious crime syndicate in Rome have deceptively led people to worship the devil. Unbeknownst to them, like Jesus said, you know not what you worship. Now, people in America, and if you would admit it to yourself, when I say the word worship, okay, when I say that in our natural state, does that, do we not shy away from that idea? Why is that? Okay, the reason why that is true is if you go back to Genesis 9, Noah had three boys by name, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, those three guys were the three beginning of the basic races in the world. In the Middle East, as they left from there, God gave a certain blessing on each one, and that becomes, shall we say, their niche in life. Now, Shem, that would be the Orientals, and Shem was given a spiritual blessing, and if you study the Shemites... Orientals, you will see people that know how to worship. 
the Buddhist hours sitting at a pagoda. Yoga, cross-legged, say in the middle two letters of Rome, Om, Om. Now, now for us um, Japhethites, we come from Japheth, we sit there and look at that and say, that is a drag. That is a waste of time. Why? Because God gave Japheth a different mentality or a different niche in life. And it says that Japheth shall enlarge himself. So, so when you see the Shemites, the Orientals, you see religions of the Oriental roots, it will be a religion that is rooted in worship. Okay, the, when we was in Vietnam, we attended a, went to a couple of Buddhist pagodas. And the, one of the, the uh, Vietnam pastors, Mike Roberts, had taught him a couple of English words, and one was stupid. And so as we're going through this Buddhist pagoda, he would say, stupid! Now, he couldn't say it exactly what we said. He'd say, stupid! <laughs> of course, they didn't know what he was saying. But he was right. But still the idea is they know how to worship. Now, Japheth, he was given the blessing to enlarge himself, to expand, and to explore. So if you go to World Book Encyclopedia, look under the word Explorers, it'll have a series of pages in there of the men who explored the world or this continent or that continent, and 98% of them will come from Japheth. Why? That's rooted in us. What's rooted in us? Work. Work. That's rooted in us. Worship to us? Ew. Drag. Boring. Sicko. Okay? Work will do that. This is why a lot of churches, when they talk about uh, your service for the church or for God, what do they say? Service. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do this. And that's the way you demonstrate your love toward God. Worship? No, we don't want to do that. That's not in our nature. So we understand that. Occidentals, that's what's often called uh, the white race, generally speaking, that uh, we tend to rather work than worship. And this is why churches, especially in the Baptist crowd, they emphasize so much of doing. Where Orientals will worship. They'll sit there and bong every 15 seconds. And that one Buddhist pagoda went to bong. I, I hate to be that person at nighttime when I go to bed. Bong all the time. Okay, they worship. They understand worship. We don't understand it. Okay, and... A lot of us would rather read the Bible than pray. You know, in the hymn book, Sweet Hour of Prayer, analyze your prayer life. When's the last time you prayed an hour? It's more like sweet drag hour of prayer. What am I thinking? I've run out of things to pray about. But in reality, that's our nature. I'm not, I'm not justifying our fault in that. Okay? But the idea is the Lord seeks such to worship him. Now, Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3 about the judgment seat of Christ. And at the judgment seat of Christ, he mentions that there's gold, silver, precious stones that's being offered as reward. What are those things? What do they represent? Okay, does God only bless rich people, gold, silver, and precious stones who gave money to him and he's going to give that back to them? Or do those things represent something else? Now, in the Old Testament... Those the furniture in the Jewish temple were overlaid with gold. And you'll see that all through there. So gold in the Bible represents worship. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that we are to lay up treasures in heaven. So the idea there is that when we worship God that's pleasing to him, we're laying up gold in heaven. Silver in the Bible is a, is a is a typology of redemption because Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But silver also portrays the word of God because he says it's preserved in Psalms 12 and 6 and he uses silver as an example, purified as silver. And this way we have a common saying called a silver-tongued orator. So when you and I use our tongue to speak the words of God to others... We are laying up silver in heaven. Okay, that's the pattern. Now, sometimes people will say that so-and-so is on fire for God. 
Okay, now when they say that, they're saying that they're really actively doing something, serving, doing something for God, because that's the Japheth mindset, which is not bad in itself. Okay, but to be on fire, if you have a wood stove or a fireplace, especially a wood stove, you see an analogy in a wood stove. I got a wood stove. It's uh, working right now. And so the idea goes is when I, before I put wood in the wood stove, there's some hot coals, but they usually are not laid out in a good fashion. So I take a, uh, a stoker, a sharp pointed metal, and then I'll stoke the coals and I'll kind of get them all laid out nice and dandy there. And then I'll put wood on top, pull out the, the flu so air can come in and that thing will fire right up. Now, here's the analogy. Okay, we're the wood, like a tree. We have a family tree. On fire for God. Now, every once in a while, you've got to stoke it or goad it. The Bible word is goading it. Okay, where in Ecclesiastes, it talks about the preacher goading. And that's the purpose of church. The purpose of a church service is that I take the goad, you get the point, and I'm going to take the ashes and move them around. And then put the wood in a fire and pull out and let the wind come through, the Holy Ghost come through, and then stoke up that fire. Now, if you take a coal out of there and put it aside by itself, you know, not with my hand, I'm not like an angel, but I got my shovel, and take it and set it aside by itself, that'll get coolest the quickest. Okay, and that's what the purpose of getting together on these things. Okay, but the idea of worship is the thought this morning. So I, what I did is I looked at the word worship in the Bible and found out that there's, there's obviously more ways to worship God. We don't have to sit here, you know, and, you know, just do it here. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it later today. You can do it on your own. Worship God and lay up gold in heaven. So what you do is you look up the word throughout the Bible. Okay, in English. Thank God for that. Okay, and the first time the word worship, I'm just going to cite some of the passages. Genesis 22, verse 5 is the very first time the word worship is found in the Bible. And if you remember that story, Genesis 22 is when God told Abraham, I want you to take Isaac up and, and uh, sacrifice him. And when he and Isaac are getting ready to go off, there's a servant that's helped them out. And, and uh, Abraham said to the servant, he said, I and the lad are going to go and worship yonder and come again to you. So he had in his mind that Isaac was going to be sacrificed and resurrected up on the mountain. That was in his head. But what is worship first connected to in the Bible? A great sacrifice. The more you and I say in sports, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And the more you sacrifice The sacrifice that you give for God, God in heaven is taking that as worship. Laying up gold in heaven. Abraham demonstrated it. Now, when I say uh, the sacrifice, God is not looking at the value of what we're giving. He's looking at the sacrifice of it. Example, the widow's might did not give much. But God looked at the sacrifice How much we're putting into it. This is one thing that missionaries have a difficulty, especially American missionaries, especially in Africa. It's because when they see an American, they see money. And these guys have a desire to get to work, and so how are they going to do it? They're going to have to spend the money. And the Africans are taking and taking and taking. Not only them, but it's in any poor culture. And you don't blame them, man. If I was in their shoes, I'd kind of do the same thing. But the thing is, is that they don't, if they don't learn to give back or sacrifice themselves, then if the missionary is pulled out, it'd be like nothing ever happened because they haven't learned to sacrifice. There's, I, I've given several Bibles uh, to some Filipino pastors that gotten my name online. And one fella, I think I've sent him over 100 Bibles. And it's not the Bible that's costly, it's the shipping that's costly. But uh, this one fella, very poor situation, but twice now he's done it where he's asked for my address. He sent me dried uh, bananas and dried papaya. The box just sent it to me. 
Okay, now I knew that was a great... That was more of a sacrifice that he did for me than I've done for him. Now, it's good that he does that, not for my sake, but for his sake. That's worship. When he's boxing up these things, I doubt in his mind he thinks I'm worshiping God. But he is worshiping God. And God in heaven is marking that down. And chiching in heaven, there's some gold laid out for him. That's our gifts that we give. Okay, that's when we give to missions. We find uh, not, not, not these guys on TV. That, a lot of that stuff is sham. It's where you find a Bible-believing missionary. You find a work that they're doing. And then you want to offer something to help them. Time, money, uh, effort, prayers. Okay, God is looking at the sacrifice of that. He's looking at the quality of it. It's like quality is you pay for something, you pay the higher value. Why? Because it's a quality you're looking for. And God's looking for the same thing. So one way, one form of, uh, any form of sacrifice, okay, uh, effort that people come to church. I mean, you know, I was surprised how many folks were here. I'm not saying the ones that weren't here weren't willing to sacrifice. Each person got to decide for themselves. You know, it's, it's ended up in a ditch, not a good idea. But still the effort, any effort that we put forth of trying to get close to God, God is seeing that as worship. Okay, the second time the word worship is found is in Genesis 24, 26. And that will be um, Elimelech, the servant of... Abraham, Abraham was trying to get a son for his, uh, or uh, um, trying to get a bride for his son. Didn't want, our, didn't want him to marry a Canaanite, so he had to go out of the territory. And he said to him, here's what I want you to do. Make a deal with me. You find this bride for me, bring her back, and then we're going to have a bride for Isaac. Now, this servant, he was praying, Lord, please give me direction. Man, this is quite a request you're asking of me to do. He said, God, please help me. Please help me. Show me where to go. Show me what to do. He comes across this well. And, it, and this girl came up, and she's going to water her animals. And he said, could you help me out? And he had, had had a little deal there with God. He said, if this is the one, then I want you this to happen. And when everything worked out, all the little details worked out, you know what the Bible says in Genesis 26, 24? He said he bowed and worshipped. What, what does that take place? That's our gratitude when God answers our prayers. When God gives us direction. There's times where I didn't know what to do, and so I did the spiritual thing. I flipped the coin. Now, that is a spiritual thing if you pray about it. Now, you don't do two out of three, the best out of three, the best out of five, until you get what you want. If you got a direction where you're not sure which way to go, cast a lot. I do. I'll flip a coin. I like it when God gives a no-brainer. That's what I pray for a direction. Lord, please make it a no-brainer because I don't got much of a brain. I want to know exactly what you want me to do. And if the Lord does that, thank you. Worship him. Gratitude. Bob Jones Sr. said that when a man has lost his gratitude, he is well nigh hopeless. A loss of gratitude, I'm sorry to say, is this generation. Entitlements. A lack of gratitude is one of the very first steps down the road to a reprobate mind. When a guy gets on the highway to go to the road on the reprobate mind, the sign there is a lack or no gratitude. Romans one twenty five. And so when God answers our prayer, this is what Gideon did when Gideon was so unsure about going into that battle with 300 guys and then he snuck down to a tent, and he heard this guy interpret a dream, and then he got an answer again. Third time, I think, it was a confirmation he had there. It says that he worshipped God. Did that out in the dark of the night by a tent in the trees all by himself or with a scout that was with him. Okay, that's a way we worship God, gratitude. Another way is the usual way that we think of is adoration or, or admire. That'd be Exodus 34, 8. That would be Moses when he wants to see God, and it says he worshiped God. What did he do? He admired and adored God. Okay, to admire and adore God is, is what we understand to be worship. Okay, and that is a, a way to worship God. But the best way to do that, one way is when we sing, is we're th- sing, singing the Lord. But another way is we get alone with God and admire him. 
And when you get out alone and in creation, and you admire the creation and you, uh, you know, appreciate the creation, but don't just limit it to appreciating the beauty of the creation. How about the God of creation? Okay, where in another one down that road of a reprobate mind is where it says that they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. You see, where in the Declaration of Independence, the, the uh, Thomas Jefferson, maybe the writer of that, wrote in there where he said, the laws of nature and nature's God. Not just nature, but nature's God. We don't want to limit it to that, to nature. You see, and this is the glorious aspect, the scientific aspect of DNA, where science finally caught up with some things of the Bible, where DNA proves there's a God. There's an intelligent being that programmed in our DNA that's unique to each and every one of us. And when a scientist is looking at that, he cannot get away from the fact that an intelligent being did that. And that's an amazing thing, scientifically right in front of them. But the laws of nature and nature's God is, according to Psalm 29, where we read seven times the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord. What sustains this earth is this book right here, according to Hebrews 1.3. The world is upheld by the word of his power. Now, people adore celebrities and famous people, and they put their pictures on the wall and everything. And that's worship. And young people will go to these concerts, these rocks concerts, and they're yelling and screaming. They are worshiping that person. That is a worship service. And they're not hiding who they're worshiping these days. They used to hide it in back masks and all that stuff. It's right in their face these days who they're worshiping. Oh, but the Christians, they won't do that. They won't go to the rock concerts. They'll sit there and worship the contemporary ones. You know, the first contemporary Christian song is Exodus 32 with Aaron and the golden calf. And if you read back in there, you'll find Sandy Patty and Amy Grant was in there. And Elvis was in there in the early days of his singing as he sang through the church of God. And you'll find all that back in there. Nothing's changed. Nothing new under the sun. Oh, some of the, the Christians, they won't go to the concert and worship, but they'll go to a church and worship the dude behind the pulpit. And lift them up too high. Now we know the Catholics, they do that. Where they lift up the Pope too high. Where the first Italian you find in the Bible in Acts chapter 10. And he bowed and worshipped the first prince of the Pope. And what Peter do? He said, get up, I'm a man like you. And so, but yet, we'll put people too high on a pedestal. When people put somebody too high on a pedestal, when that person gets knocked down, then their faith is knocked down. All men are feet of clay. And so the thing is, is we want to make sure we keep it and adore God and put man in his place where we know that he is. Yes, you can have respect towards somebody for their work's sake. But just remember, he's just a sinner saved by grace. Any and all, any and all of us. But to some of these guys that put themselves too high in a pedestal kind of enjoy that. They get to worshiping their works of their own hand and then they'll start putting some things of the Bible aside because it affects their ministry. What are they doing? They're worshiping the works of their own hand rather than the God that they should be worshiping. Now, Jeremiah demonstrated some unusual form of worship toward the Lord, but he did what God told to do. And what God told Jeremiah to do one time is he went out in front of the Jewish temple in Jeremiah chapter 7, and as these people were filing in the Jewish temple, there he was all by himself. And he said, yeah, go to the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. You're going to hear words that aren't going to profit you. Boy, he got real popular real fast. But they would have not known it. They would have gone in there and had fake worship. And he's out there truly worshiping God, telling him to do something that was really out of the ordinary. I'm not saying that's what you and I should do, but boy, that's what he told him to do. But he adored God for it. Another way of worship is the way we like to do it. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16. There where the Lord told the, the Jews, he said, don't serve pagan gods and worship them. So there is where service does become a worship. 
but it depends on our motives. Our motives of service can become a worship if the motive is done proper. And what's the motive? We can serve God and man. Now, our love for God is first and foremost that should motivate us to serve Him. Our love for Him. Because a man can and actually die as a martyr, according to 1 Corinthians 13, but if he doesn't have charity, it profiteth him nothing. It did him of no good. So God is looking at our motives. Now, we can serve our fellow man and be kind to a believer and try to help out a believer and sacrifice and help out a believer. But what is our motive for doing that? Our motive should be because of our love toward God. Now, if it's because we love that person, that's fine and dandy too. No problem with that. But if we're going to do it because it makes us feel good, that's what a lot of people do. Is they, do they help other people because it makes them feel good. And yeah, that is true. It does. But we got a reward if that's our limit. If we've done it because of our charity for God. Now, proof of this is in John 12, where you had Mary, where she had this special essential oil or some type of an oil, an anointing oil. And on the 10th day of the first month, she came into the time with Jesus and she took that alabaster box and broke it, that great sacrifice, and anointed Jesus' death. She did that on the 10th day, matching the Passover back in the old days. And on the 14th day, he was crucified. Now, while she was doing that great sacrifice, because of her love for Jesus Christ, Judas Iscariot piped up and said, we could have sold that and gave it to the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you got always. You don't always got me. In other words, a gift out of love to Jesus Christ outweighs Gifts to the poor. Why? Because the poor you got always, he said. And so if, if any religious leader of any faith publicly said something like that, people would crucify him. I think somebody did get crucified. And that shows us that our service, if we're doing it because of our love for the Lord, that becomes a valid worship. And God lays up some treasures in heaven. Last one I want to look at is in Acts 24. This is an unusual one. In Acts 24, verse 14. This one I'll just take a gander at, take a look at. This is the Apostle Paul. And he made a statement in Acts 24, 14. And he said this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Okay, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Okay, that's the entire sentence. Now, what's he saying? Okay, somebody in the context is calling his beliefs heresy. Who is saying that? The Pharisees of his day. The religious fundamentalists of his day were saying, Paul's a heretic, he's a cultist. And Paul said, all I do is believe all that was written. I believe the entire Old Testament. That's what he's referring to. I believe all things that are written in the Law and the Prophets. And when a man believes all the words of the Bible, the conservative Christians, the evangelical Christians, the fundamentalist Christians who have a little small set beliefs, good beliefs, will brand a Bible believer to be a cultist, a heretic. And when that name is thrown out, a lot of people shy away from that, and then they get afraid of that idea and kind of give up some of their beliefs in order to comply. But the Lord says, Paul said, this is how I worship God. If they want to call me that, I don't care. I'll take that title gladly. And you see, what all this is, a form of worship is to believe all that God has written. Every bit of it, from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. Now, I didn't say obey, except in this fashion. 
In Romans 10, they said, how do we obey the gospel? Well, we believe it. How do we obey doctrines of the Bible? We believe them. We obey instructions. We might change this action or action here because of the instructions of the Bible, but we believe doctrine. When we believe doctrine, that's obeying doctrine by believing it. I believe in the second coming of Christ. I cannot force it. I cannot do what people did in the 1999, this one website, clonejesus.com, where they were tired of waiting for Jesus' second coming, and so they were going to take some DNA off of the relics that they got out of Israel, place that in a virgin of April of 1999, hoping to give birth to Jesus in Christmas of 1999, ushering in the millennium in 2000. Yeah, that was an actual website. They thought they were going to force the second coming, obey the second coming. You, believe, you obey the second coming by believing it. Paul said, I believe all the prophets. He didn't say, I'm going to obey. In fact, when Paul in Acts chapter 9 was obeying Deuteronomy 13 to kill somebody over religion, when he was doing that, in the process of continuing to do that, he got saved and he stopped obeying Deuteronomy 13. Why? Rightly dividing word of truth. So when a fundamentalist brands a Bible believer a Rachmanite, I don't care. When I, first, when I got down to Rensselaer and, and, and get calls from missionaries to come in, the first two or three years, any missionary that called me, I'd let him come in. I was trying to help him out. And it got to the point where the folks in church said, man, these guys cannot preach. We don't want to hear this anymore. <laughs> We'd rather hear you. That sounded good to me. But, uh, and so they said, you got to start weeding these out. I said, okay, I'll do that. So the first four guys had called. Here's what I did. I said, first four guys, you know, they, I'd say, okay, you're missionary. Okay, this is the date I got. You can come on this date. You set and sign and seal and deliver. Okay. Before they hung up, I said, I want to tell you something. Okay, yeah. I said, I'm a Bible believer. And all four said, wonderful, so am I. I said, let me clarify. I am a King James Bible believer. I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. And all four got arguing. All four got arguing with me. I didn't argue with them. I think all four brought up the name Ruckman. And I didn't say anything. I didn't defend anything unless they espoused a lie. I said, what you just said is a lie, and here's why it's a lie. All four canceled the meeting. I thought, well, good. I didn't have to worry about that. All four canceled it. Number five calls. He starts off, I'm a missionary to juvenile delinquents in Indiana. My first thought was, gag me with a spoon, but okay. And then he says, we give a Bible to every young person that gets saved. I said, okay, that's good blessing. Praise the Lord. So I thought, I'm going to try a different method. I said, what kind of Bible do you give him? He said, we give him a King James Bible. So I thought I'd scare him. I said, oh, don't that make you a Ruckmanite? And he says, it doesn't matter what you call me. I believe the word of God. And my response was, have you ever heard of him? <laughs> he said, I have several commentaries. I said, so do I. Why don't you come on up? <laughs> And that turned out to be Tony York. He's a pastor in Victory Baptist, southwest of uh, Indianapolis. And uh, it turned out to be a blessing. See, it didn't matter to him what you called him. It didn't matter if the fundamentalists say he's a cultist, he's a heretic. You know, of the ones that I went to school from, some of them have branded me a heretic and a cultist. Okay, who cares? I'll take that. Why? That's a form of worship. You say, well, that's going to affect people. That's their problem. If they're going to take, you know, rumors of somebody else instead of checking it out themselves, that's their problem. Okay? I just believe what God said. He said, like Paul said, I believe God even as it was told me. Well, what did God tell me? Psalm 12, he preserved his words without error. I believe that. Does that make me dumb? Well, then mark me down as dumb. Put a big D on front. My, my initials are duh anyway, so what, who cares? It doesn't matter to me. 
Okay? The thing is, is that's a form of worship. If you would, one more place, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Paul said this in verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Second Corinthians 6, 3. Okay, so then he's describing some things that he has done in his ministry as a minister. Verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and then drop to 8. In 8 he says this, by honor and dishonor. That's right. By evil report and good report, as deceivers, and yet true. Oxymoron. Yeah. The, the fundamentalists will say about that Bible here, he's deceiving people. By not adding to the Bible, by not subtracting from the Bible, by not changing anything, I'm deceiving them? Well, that's what you do. Yet true. As unknown and yet well-known, They don't get good press. As unknown and yet well known as dying, and behold, we live as chastened and not killed. So Paul says, you know, there's a form of worship. Just believe God. You know, can you imagine, you know, being called a liar? Most preachers in a pulpit this morning are calling God a liar. This was said here, but this is what it means. This is what it should have been. It should have been better translated this way. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, who died and made you God? Well, I did. Yeah, that's right. And that's a sad thing is a lot of them tend to think that way. That's why they like the admiration. Worship. So these are different ways that uh, we can worship God, and it's worthy worship And God is pleased to accept that. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to recognize that it's just not the idea of adoring you, admiring you, which we ought to do. Sing songs to you by ourselves. As some people will doodle, and they'll doodle about things, about things that they care about. Okay, how about doodling about Jesus Christ, my Savior. Jesus Christ saves. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. Things like that, where we admire you, adore you. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to worship you and that you'd be pleased to accept that worship. That it would be done right because we have charity toward thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.